Hello again. This is our fourth session in uh, our Stories of the Old Testament. A uh, quick review of the, uh, the favorite narratives of the Old Testament from Abraham to Nehemiah. In this particular uh, session, we're going to look at the root of the Exodus and the conquest. I'm sorry, we're going to look at the conquest. And I wanted to start with a uh, brief review of the Exodus route. Let's take a look at the map here. We are told that the Israelites who were centered in Goshen were led from the land uh, by Moses with the uh, help of the Lord. They ended up at Mount Sinai, a place of um, considerable controversy, although this is the most commonly uh, identified location at the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. And then they made an extended meandering trip up to Mount Nebo, uh, arriving there approximately 40 years after the, um, after the exodus had occurred. And this was the view that they were able to achieve from uh, Mount Nebo. This is what Moses saw. He was able to see the Dead Sea. Uh, off to the north was the plains of Moab uh, with the Promised Land off in the distance. However, blocking their entry into the Promised Land was the fortified city of Jericho. And um, the background, incidentally, in this particular, uh, this particular session is the view from uh, Abel Shatim, the location of the Israelites, looking across the Jordan Valley uh, with the uh, modern oasis of, of Jericho in the distance against the hills of Israel. Now, the, we are told that the Israelites remained at Abel Shatim on the east side of the Jordan River while they prepared for their attack on Jericho. Abel Shatim is identified in most atlases today as Tel El Hamam, which is the site that is being excavated by Dr. Steve Collins of Trinity Southwest University. Uh, the discoveries of the last couple of years have uh, almost certainly identified our site as uh, the uh, destroyed city of Sodom. And uh, so it was Sodom, and it was on the ruins of Sodom that the Israelites centered their, uh, their headquarters as they were preparing for the attack on Jericho. Now, once they were rested and prepared, the waters in the Jordan River were stopped up to allow their passage, uh, creating a, uh, a way for them to get across the river. Uh, the suggestion that this was during flood stage would uh, argue for a, an attack that took place uh, in the springtime, and uh, the, if uh, with uh, earthquakes or any type of activity of the Lord to block up the river, the river level would fall, and it would allow the Israelite troops to uh, cross over the uh, the river gorge and get to the other side. Let's take a look at the map here and see how this plays out. In the lower right, you can see Abel Shatim, uh, or the Tell of uh, Hamam. Uh, on the plains of Moab, and far across on the other side of the plain, approximately 15 miles away, is the city of Jericho. Now, the city itself would not have been identifiable at that distance, but certainly the greenery of the oasis where the spring is located uh, would tell them where Jericho was located. And the Jordan River uh, bisects this large plain. Although today you can't see the Jordan River from ground level, there's very little water in it, and it has cut a channel that's below ground level, and so unless you're on top of the river, you really can't see it. It would have been necessary for them to charge across the, uh, the plains, and uh, we all are familiar uh, with the story of the, uh, the Battle of Jericho and the collapsing of the walls and the ultimate destruction of the city. They established their headquarters at the site of the ruins of Jericho, calling it Gilgal, and then it was necessary to travel up into the hill country to attack a site called Ai, or Ai. Uh, this particular location was probably a small border fortification, which was on the edge of the uh, territories that had been laid out by the city-states uh, up on the Jordanian Plateau. Uh, Actually, there were two battles up there. They had to work their way up to Ai and eventually destroyed it. 
But there were two battles up there. Uh, the first one was a failure. Uh, there had been uh, some um, violation of the rules down at Gilgal, and that had to be reckoned with before they could then send uh, another force back up to attack the city of Ai. Um, and that's a, wonderful, um, th that's a wonderful narrative in the Bible. It's a very detailed military uh, campaign. It talks about how forces were sent up and one was able to um, locate itself in a wadi uh, in, in hiding as an ambush squad and then uh, the rest of the force would lure out the uh, defenders of Ai. And uh, a very um, likely candidate for the city of Ai has been excavated at a place called Kerbet Makater. And uh, it's, it's, uh, that, that looks, as, looks like a very promising location. It fits the Bible story extremely well. Once they had conquered the city of Ai, they had control of the, of the roads and the, the, major, uh, the major pathways leading from Jericho to the highlands. And they also had control of the region around Jericho where the trade routes and the roads would uh, be crossing the Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea. They were now ready to undertake a campaign in the highlands uh, to gain control of that region as well, and we'll take a look at the map for that. Uh, they were located at Abel Shatim, right below Mount Nebo, as you can see on the map here. Once they conquered Gilga, or once they conquered Jericho, they were able to establish their base camp, as it were, at a place called Gilgal, and from there they then traveled up and they burned the city of Ai. However, there was a coalition of several cities of Canaanite soldiers to the south, and it was necessary to fight a major battle, uh, this being the battle in which uh, Joshua uh, chased the armies down the hill and uh, slaughtered the, the, the various armies. It should be noted that he didn't take control of the cities. The Bible makes no claim to that effect. He simply defeated the armies uh, when the sun stood still in the sky. Another battle was necessary with a coalition of soldiers to the north under the leadership of Yabin uh, from Hatzor. And uh, once the battle was, was played out at that area, they had effectively conquered all of the armies that could be brought against them uh, in their campaigns. And uh, they were able to, um, able to then celebrate their victory and... Um, one of the places that they hadn't conquered was Shechem. Uh, the, apparently the Shechemites had become allies of theirs or certainly had not uh, opposed them in any way and so they traveled to Shechem to do their, uh, their celebration and their rededication to the Lord. Now the question is, why not Shechem? Why didn't they attack Shechem? And uh, the answer is probably because that's land that was, uh, that was owned by Jacob way back when, hundreds of years earlier, Jacob had traveled through with his family. Uh, he had left under uh, unpleasant circumstances, but nevertheless, it was his land. Uh, and they were probably regarded as distant relatives or at least uh, potential allies. And at that point, uh, they were able, to, the Israelites were able to travel to Shechem. Uh, it was probably at that point that they took the body of Joseph and left it for, uh, for burial. And then they, uh, they settled down at that point to allot the various territories to the tribes. Uh, let's take a look at that, according to the map here again. If you look at the land of Israel you are told that the Lord said to Moses, when you enter Canaan, the land that will be allotted to you will have these boundaries. And then the Bible goes on in Numbers. It says your southern boundary will be such and such, your western boundary will be such and such, same for the northern and eastern boundaries. And it says this will be your land. Now if we plot out all of the instructions that are contained in that extended passage, we find that the biblical boundaries of Israel uh, extended along the south and then up the Mediterranean into the uh, region of what would be modern Lebanon today, crossing over into the Golan, which is modern southwest Syria, and then down the Jordan Valley, uh, creating an outline for land as you see uh, essentially here. However, the allotment of the tribes uh, played out a little bit differently. 
As they were marching up from um, the uh, Exodus, the tribe of Reuben on the east side of the Jordan Valley uh, determined that this would be a, uh, an, an attractive place to be. This was essentially the land of the Amorites. And uh, the tribe of Gad determined that uh, they wanted uh, similar territory on the east side. And a good portion of the tribe of Manasseh uh, was located to the north. Now, these men were told that they could remain in those areas if that was territory that they wanted. Uh, but they would have to join the, uh, the main force, travel across into Canaan, and uh, take part in the battles to conquer the land. Uh, if you look at these areas in a modern map, they're only about 20 miles wide, and then there's desert off to the east. These are very small territory allotments, and that's one of the uh, striking features of the Bible is how small these lands are. Now, after the conquest... Uh, they sat down with Joshua, and by uh, lots, they were able to determine who would get what pieces of property from that point on. The next uh, assignment of property was to the tribe of Judah. Uh, they got the lion's share of Canaan, although a good portion of the southern area is the Negev, and it's fairly arid and uh, not suitable for large populations. The next tribe was Ephraim. They got some choice property in the center of the Judean highlands. And they, they were followed by the remainder of the tribe of Manasseh, which must have been a, uh, a sizable tribe indeed, because uh, even split in half, they received two uh, fairly good-sized allotments. Uh, remember that Manasseh and Ephraim are the sons of Joseph in Egypt, and they are referred to uh, collectively as the house of Joseph. In other words, the territories that were given to Ephraim and Manasseh would normally have gone to one brother, but because of uh, uh, the favoritism shown towards Joseph, he was given two territories, uh, for one for each of his sons. The next uh, piece of territory was Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, a very narrow strip that leads from uh, the area north of the Dead Sea up to the highlands just north of Jerusalem, but it contained the major highways leading east and west and also the intersection of the north-south highways. So economically, it was uh, apparently a very desirable piece of property. There were four tribes that then... Oh, oh the tribe of Simeon uh, was given territory in the middle of the uh, territory of Judah, and we never hear from them again, apparently. They were assimilated and, and just kind of faded from, uh, faded from history, uh, being overpowered by the larger and more powerful uh, tribe of Judah. Four tribes took the area of Upper and Lower Galilee. These are very, very tiny allotments, perhaps 15 miles in diameter, for example, Zebulon. But that was the uh, Jezreel Plain, which was the breadbasket of this part of the country. Uh, the tribe of Issachar <laughs> received a piece of territory that really uh, had nothing to recommend it. Uh, the Asherites uh, were given the coastal region, and then uh, the tribe of Naphtali was given the upper Galilee region, which again is very harsh and unforgiving and, and not particularly uh, suitable for, uh, for agriculture. And then finally the tribe of Dan was given an area uh, that included some of the Philistine territories, and ultimately they were forced to relocate far to the north to the, what became the city of Dan. Now, this takes us into the time of the judges. Uh, once they had conquered the land and settled into their uh, allotments, they divided into smaller tribal groups. Some of these were quite small, some of them a little bit larger, but they would then spread out uh, into their individual family groups, uh, establishing a, uh, a semi-nomadic existence for the next 150 years or so. But then, uh, as one would expect, they become more sedentary. Uh, they begin to settle down, and we know this because towns begin to appear in the highlands that are uniquely Israelite. In other words, they have certain types of agriculture. The houses are built a certain way that we can identify. Uh, they have certain kinds of pottery. And uh, we are able to identify Canaanite areas as opposed to Israelite areas scattered through the highlands. 
And uh, at this point, we begin to read about occasional battles between the Canaanites and the various groups of the Israelites, the Canaanites regarding them as intruders, almost certainly. You may recall that in the book of Joshua, they conquered armies, but they didn't occupy the towns. They were nomads. They didn't want to live in towns. They wanted to live according to their traditional ways. And so the towns were left in the hands of the Canaanites. What they accomplished with their conquest of Canaan was the right to remain, basically. Let's take a look, though, at how the Canaanites reacted to some of this. If we look at the map here, we are told early on, a, a one of the tribes under the leadership of a judge named Otniel uh, fought the Arameans. Now, these would have been the very early Arameans. They would become a much more powerful nation uh, during the time of uh, Solomon and beyond. But at this particular time, uh, they probably objected to the tribe of Manasseh up in that area. Uh, we are told that Ehud... Uh, led a group of Ephraimites to fight the Moabites uh, who had sent some uh, soldiers down. They were harassing the area of the, uh, of the tribe and had set up a small um, headquarters on the ruins of Jericho. This actually is one of my favorite stories. He's a left-handed soldier that sneaks in and, and assassinates the Moabite king. Um, there is also a description of a judge named Deborah who leads uh, a coalition of tribes against some of the Canaanites, and also uh, the story of Gideon. There are numerous tribes, but these are the most important of the stories. And then finally, this particular story about Jephthah, Jephthah uh, fighting the Ammonites is interesting because at that point, which we can date to close to 1100 B.C., uh, the Ammonites are arguing that Yephthah and the Israelites have no right to that land, and his response is that they've been there for 300 years. This is one of those little dating passages that helps us move the uh, time of the Exodus back to around 1400, 1446, depending on how you wish to uh, work with the numbers, but it suggests that they had been there for nearly 300 years. There is no mention, however of a group of people called Philistines. And the question is, why not? All through the time of the judges, there's no mention of Philistines in the land. The reason for this is, uh, again, uh, it can be derived from looking at the history. The, um, in around 1200 BC, there was a great change in the balance of power in the ancient world. Uh, the great powers of the ancient Near East all collapsed. The Egyptians went into a serious decline. Uh, Mesopotamia collapsed, and uh, they had uh, considerable fighting among themselves for control of the region, and they were no longer a, an, an area of influence in the uh, Fertile Crescent. And uh, the areas up around Turkey collapsed as well. These would have been the Hittites, and they were literally burned out of existence and uh, were not rediscovered until about 1900 A.D. Uh, by British explorers at a time when uh, many Bible scholars agreed that there never had even been any real Hittites, that it was simply a, uh, a fictional narrative. But uh, during this time, starting around 1200 B.C., all of these tiny kingdoms then had some freedom to... Uh, expand their own power, and we have all these little ites coming into existence, Moabites, Edomites, uh, Ammonites, uh, the, uh, the uh, Phoenicians, and most importantly, of course, uh, the Israelites. And they had a period of about 200 years where they were able to exercise their own authority in their tiny little corner of the, uh, of, uh, the, the, the Near East. However, uh, around 1200 B.C., while everything else was collapsing, the same thing happened in the Aegean, and a group of people who were related to the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey people, the Mycenaeans, uh, descendants of these, known as the Sea Peoples, were driven out of Greece and they spread all over the Mediterranean with a large group of them coming down the east coast of the Mediterranean starting in the middle 1100s. Now, this is long after the time of the conquest, and this is way into the time of the judges, which is why you don't realize or you don't recognize any Philistines in the region until that time because they simply hadn't arrived yet. Let's take a look at how the map plays out for this event. 
We have the Israelites coming up the east side of the Great Rift and finally establishing themselves in the highlands of uh, Judea and creating the land of, of uh, the land of Israel. However, uh, in the 1100s BC, this group of sea peoples migrated down the coast. They had centered themselves in Cyprus and then were working their way down the coast and burning and looting and sacking cities as they went, destroying. They went all the way to Egypt, and there they were stopped by an Egyptian king who claims that he stopped them and drove them back. And they turned, and within just a few years of burning out all of the cities on the coast, they rebuilt and reestablished five major cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath, and Ekron. And many of you may recognize those as the um, uh, pentapolis of the Philistines. So here we are in the middle 1100s. The Philistines have finally arrived. And um, this would be a, um, uh, a time of, of a fairly uneasy truce. L can we go back to that previous slide, please? I meant to show something here. With the Philistines on the coast and the Israelites up in the hill country, uh, the Philistines were spreading eastward into the foothills as the Israelites at this point were becoming more sedentary and building towns down in that area. And of course, the foothills became a flashpoint for many of the battles that took place between the Philistines and the Israelites. Now, this, as I said, was a time of an uneasy truce. Perhaps they seem to have gotten along. Um, note the uh, narrative of Samson. <laughs> Samson would do his carousing, his drinking and his carousing in uh, Philistine cities, and he even wanted his parents to arrange a um, marriage uh, with a Philistine woman uh, that turns out uh, rather disastrously and uh, ends with uh, Samson uh, being involved with Delilah and all of the stories that, uh, that follow along with that. The Philistines had a military advantage. They had better organization. They were a powerful military people. And they had iron technology. They had smithies and the uh, Canaanites didn't. And relations deteriorated into a major battle at Aphek in uh, 1075 BC. If we look at the map here, we will find that the Battle of Samson was uh, ranging his activities in the region that you see there. But a little further north, uh, the Battle of Aphek took place. This was the one where um, uh, the Ark was captured by the uh, Philistines for a time. And after that particular battle, there was um, 20 years later, there was a convocation taking place under the leadership of Samuel, and we'll discuss him in our next session. And a, um, a Philistine army attempted a, um, a surprise attack on Mizpah that was beaten back. But at that particular point, the Israelites had uh, reached the realization that they were not able to effectively defend themselves against the uh, Philistines. What they insisted at that point was a, uh, a king. They wanted somebody to rule them and unite them. Uh, actually, this was the... Uh, the function of Samuel at that point. He was their religious leader, but he was also a unified, uh, a judge over a unified uh, Israel and was supposed to uh, function in that position. But uh, they insisted that they have a king anointed, and we'll talk about Saul in our next, our next session as well. However, Saul was selected uh, very grudgingly by uh, Samuel, who was ordered to do so by the Lord, and if we look at the map here, we can see that the uh, territory of King Saul basically included all of the hill country. This is where the Israelites were located in the hill country and the foothills. And uh, he was able to control that region with the Philistines still controlling the coastline. They had control of the Jezreel Plain up to the north there. And they also had control of the, um, of the Great Rift itself down in the valley. The uh, Philistines are an interesting people. We don't know, uh, we don't know their language. Uh, they're, they're, it's not been possible to uh, find any of their writings and translate them. But uh, they were a very sophisticated people. 
Uh, they can be identified by the pottery that they brought with them from the region of Greece and the Aegean. Uh, their first generation actually had the pottery that they brought with them in their possessions. Uh, we have a, um, a relief showing the Philistines uh, coming around the Mediterranean. Uh, there, there are various drawings that shows that they traveled with the men and the ships along the coast and then the women and the old elderly and the wagons and all their possessions would be going along the, uh, along the coast on the land and that they would uh, conquer the cities as they went. But uh, they disappear. Uh, eventually the coast was conquered by the, Syrian, uh, the Assyrians in the 700s BC and they disappear from history and uh, we don't know, uh, don't know. They, they, they ceased to be a unique and identifiable group. Ultimately, they were uh, subjugated by David and uh, became uh, vassal people of um, David and Solomon. So, interesting group of people, and we will look at the interaction between King Saul and the Philistines in our next session. Uh, I hope you'll join us. Bible Interact is a group of Bible scholars and biblical archaeologists who promote the Hebraic nature of Scripture and view the two Testaments as one unified message. They explain how they use a first century approach to searching the Scriptures, and they share their methods and discoveries for discussion and dialogue. They invite your comments and participation on BibleInteract.tv, where you can also find more teachings, self-study quizzes, webinars, and interviews.